If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Inside the box of Mind Pump. Whoa. For the first was... 32 minutes. I was thinking like a cereal box. Yeah. You know I mean, you open, boom, it's a prize. Do we get a prize? And here's your prize. For the first 32 minutes, we do our introductory conversation. We talk about the new season of Big Mouth. On Netflix. Oh boy, I can't yeah. wait to watch this. Spoiler alert, I give away the, the, the ending. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about uh, MMA on point breakdown of the McGregor Khabib beef. Yeah, this is my slip Ooh. up here, so I want to yeah. make sure you get my facts right so yeah. people don't jump all Go over. Go do your homework. That's right. it. Then we talk about a fatal sleep disorder, truly frightening. Fuck yeah. Uh, oh, Adam talks about how oh, Ned's hemp oil extract That's helped right. him and especially. Helped his dog. That's right. Anxiety. Mozzie and Bentley are officially sponsored by Ned now. That's right. Uh, <laughs> they Take are, some Ned and go to bed. They are one of our sponsors. They produce a very high quality hemp oil extract that is high in CBD. If you go to hello Ned, H E L L O N E D dot com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 15% off your first order. Then Justin talks about squirrels on a plane. Squirrels on a plane! It's a new movie with Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, you guys didn't know that? Apparently squirrels are good for anxiety. I thought that yeah. was the opposite. Yeah. Uh, then we talk about Organifi, and I guess they got a new product that's out called Pure. Yeah, they got two if you count the uh, the new gold juice, right? The, oh, the pumpkin spice. They flavor. just keep surprising they us. They need to send us over some stuff. Uh, but anyway, they are one of our sponsors. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and enter the code Mind Pump, you'll get a full 20% off your order. Then we get to the questions. The first question was, when changing rep ranges, should I also change the type of exercises in the routine as well? So in other words, we got one variable that we're changing. Should we change the other variables or should we also keep them consistent? Find out in this episode. I'm afraid of change. Next question was, should you stretch after your workout? Is there benefits to stretching post-workout? Uh, there are. We get into detail in that part of this episode. We also talk about MAPS Prime, which has pre and post primer sessions that utilize we did all that work for you static stretching uh at the end of the workout um you can find out more about prime uh on our site mapsfitnessproducts.com next question was alzheimer's and dementia are very common in this person's family what are some things that they can do to prevent themselves from getting it or at least reduce their the odds that they'll get it we talk about diet we talk about exercise and we talk about red light therapy and sauna therapy, believe it or not. Yeah. Now, red light therapy, we are sponsored by Juve. Uh, Juve makes some of the best red light therapy you can find. If you go to Juve, that's J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash mind pump, you will get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more and free shipping. And then, of course, we talked about sauna use. The best saunas that we found are through Sunlighten. If you go to sunlighten.com and you mention Mind Pump, so make sure you tell them you heard about them through Mind Pump. They'll give you free shipping. That's a lot of money that you're You're going to want one of those in your house. That's right. The next question is... (laughs) Wait for it. This person was asking Adam (laughs) why he did not buy the franchise Anytime Fitness. On one of his Insta stories, he was showing some of his old business plans, and uh, he had decided he wanted to open an Anytime Fitness at one point, but then backed out last minute. Why? Why was that a bad idea? Why did he say he don't want to do Why? it? Why? Hang in there. You get to dive into the brilliant business mind of Adam Schaefer in that part of this episode. Ooh. Also, it's October. Happy Halloween. This is a scary month, but it won't be scary for your body if you follow <laughs> MAPS Aesthetic. It like will make you, you look incredible. And to make it even more, uh, more of an attractive offer, we've taken MAPS Aesthetic and cut the price in half. Whoa. That's right. Half. Oh. Wow. Half off. If you go to mapsblack.com, use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K, and the number 50, no space, at checkout, you'll get 50% off our bodybuilder, physique competitor, and bikini competitor inspired program. Now, if you want to look at our other MAPS programs and bundles, if you have any questions, we got lots of videos and information on our other site, mapsfitnessproducts.com. Make sure you go check it out. Ding 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 ding
Yeah. And then uh, I realized somebody it was showed a queen me. Queen song. Was it Queen or Sting? Queen. Queen and Queen. Yeah. Queen is actually under pressure. Yes. Oh, okay. And they, you know, they have a, they have a movie coming out. They yeah, I can't I wait to watch that. Yeah, Freddie song. Mercury. <laughs> oh, such a great band. But anyway, I remember seeing that and being like, "What the fuck?" He totally copied someone else. And yeah. now I realize, as an adult, that's all they do. No, but they got one extra beat in there. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Ch- ch- he was one of the first people like that. to really start doing that, right? But I think he did it in a... Like, now they do it and in a... And then P. Diddy fucking mastered that they shit. They do it now, like, in a respectful way, right? Like, now it's like, uh, instead of a stealing, I think they're they're paying homage yeah. to the the original artist. So there's kind of a... Well, dip, they like, used to sample all those old, like, you know, the P-Funk and, like, you know, all oh, the old... That. Dude, they used to sample all of their music because it was like... It was such rad beats to work with, and then it's like they would just throw tracks on top now, of it. It sounded awesome. Now, does now rock and alternative? Do they do that? They or do. Is that, they do do that. So does country. Uh, they do some sampling. There's a lot. There's, more so than ever in the la- in the last decade. Is it common that you see um, all genres across the board pulling from each other? I mean, here, I don't have a problem with it. I think it's. I think it's create. I think when you do it creatively, I think it's really cool. Like right. Yeah. I think that that's that's what makes music so neat is you can be a uh, you know a country artist and hear a hip hop song and go okay I could yeah. I could throw a country yeah. well, spin I, on this like that's I cool can also to me. appreciate it because sometimes you hear melody that's similar to another song like the artist created a song and it's different but they understand mm. that like oh this kind of sounds like Sweet Home Alabama or whatever and so yeah. they'll throw in. You know, sweet home. At, they'll, they'll throw it in like a chorus, and they're just to kind of be like, "Yeah, I know." It does kind of sound yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like like <laughs> I, I like that though. Bro, At least they like put that in there. Have you guys been watching the second season of uh, Big Mouth? No, I yeah. watched it. Don't ruin it for me. I'm not gonna ruin it. There's no, it's not like it's not yeah. like it's a it's a mystery. Yeah, like, a plot. <laughs> like, there's, like there's a deep plot. Yeah. In it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't, tell t- don't tell me who dies, no. <laughs> bro. Yeah. That fucking show is. Fucked it, up. It's so good and so it, fucked it, up, bro. It's so vulgar, but it's amazing. Oh my god, it's terrible. Yeah, it's so bad, yeah. and it and it really does a great job. Yeah, it of, characterizes like all those old feelings you had as a kid, awkward, grown. So up. accurate. Yeah, like the character that has sex with his pillow all yeah. the time. Just banging <laughs> it's his so pillow. wrong, dude. It's so wrong. But the reason why it's funny because every about, kid's tried to hump his bed at one every point. Dude, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every dude, every dude has had sex with his something. towel mat. Yeah, it was yeah. something. That's the key. Yeah. The key is that because maybe you didn't have sex with your bed. Maybe it was your fucking oh, baseball couch. baseball mitt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, your baseball mitt. Every fucking teenage fucking... boy has tried something. Yeah, because you've seen uh, it and you looked at it and your vacuum. Yeah, what goes in your mind is. I had some good times, bro. Yeah, I had a, I dude. I, you could do a whole episode. What's the weirdest what, thing you what, fucked? <laughs> what have you fucked? That's yeah. that's not acceptable. A tree. Yeah. I had a. I I knew a kid who got his uh, his dick stuck in the jets. Of no, the you fucking, didn't. That's like an urban legend. Did you actually know somebody? I knew someone who knew someone. Maybe it yeah, didn't exactly. Yeah, dude, I, I think I it's an urban know. legend. But I heard that. I heard that too. I heard that. But yeah. I'm glad I heard that before I tried it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because <laughs> you were on your way. Yeah. Because what do you do as a kid? You thought about. It. When you're a kid at that age, you look at things, and we, the first thing in your mind is like, "Oh, that looks like it would feel like good." I wonder. Do you guys remember those? Um, God, I don't remember. I don't know what they're called, so I'm gonna try and explain it to you. Yeah. They were like these plastic tube-looking things filled with liquid, and if you try to hold it, it slides out of your hand. Oh God, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, oops, I was too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are those things called? I just outed myself. <laughs> just like, Doug, I, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever yeah, seen them? Yeah, it was like a. Yeah, that. I never, I never was You're able to, to well, like stick your fingers in it and it like slides around or whatever. I mean, That's, isn't like you, the, you can see potential. Isn't there. like the flashlight technology use the same type of like insert? Yeah. I don't know. Isn't you, it you similar? Warm it up I don't know. Who was microwave? it that? Who what is it that brought us uh, like fake vaginas? It was when we time? went to on it. No, it was no, Connor, it was when, wasn't it? Yeah, but when we went to On It, oh, yeah. when we went to On It, they, they what had a weird gift to give people. Did anybody bring those home? I did. I yeah, didn't. I, I never brought that home. I did. I, was, I, I, was, I forgot it. God forbid someone found it in my bag. Like, what the fuck is that? I don't know. <laughs> did you try it? I'm a, yeah, I did. Did you really? Yeah, it was all right. How was it? Yeah, no, we. I pulled it out. I remember I, I brought it home, and Katrina was like, "What is this?" And I'm like, "Oh, it's like this. It's like a flashlight, but a different brand, whatever." Like so. Yeah. Um, yeah, one night when we were in one of our weird kinky moods, I, I said, pull that thing out. See, mm-hmm. go to work here. Let's yeah. see what we could do here. Mm-hmm. Huh. Um, it was, uh, it's Red, just, the hand is better. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you know, there's, yeah. Uh, I guess that's what it is. Like I didn't use it by myself. 
Mm. So maybe I was just like, oh, get rid of this fucking thing. It's getting you, in the you way. You did it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even if you're by yourself, just use your, your hand. Yeah. That's it, why the toys, I don't think they do well for guys, you know? Is that true? There's no, there's no point. That, to th- it. What a great question for sex with Emily. I think yeah. that I, that would be interested to know what. Well, I can I can pretty much guarantee you, and I'm not educated on this, but I'm just based on the market because I I tend to shop the sex toy market a little bit. Uh, <laughs> nine out of ten <laughs> sex toy. Thank you for prefacing that. Yeah, no problem. Nine out of ten sex toy products are for women. They're not for guys. So discriminatory. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. why because we don't give a shit. No, well, no, you know, no. we we use our hand. But anyway, know. that that cartoon. Yeah. Last night also uh, terrified me a little bit because I got a 13 year old boy a now. I know. And I was watching it and I was remembering how I was and I was and I was thinking about my boy and I'm like, <gasps> oh yeah, he's gonna go. He's going through this. We're just like disgusting beasts yeah. walking around, <laughs> yeah, you know, just dude. raging boners. We didn't know what to do with. Yeah. He's so I, I have to. I have you know. Speaking of not being experts, not to change the subject on you guys, but you just remember you reminded me of something because I got. We just co- remembered you. I just we remembered. remembered you. Sorry, you just reminded I me you forever. Of of something that uh, I sent to Jackie this morning to put in our show notes because of course like usual, um, and I appreciate this. Uh, I don't appreciate the tact that some people have, but I do appreciate when I'm I'm corrected when I'm wrong about something. Like I'm not somebody who is like fuck you, man. Yeah. Um, I don't really appreciate it when you post it on my fucking on my public thread and you try and you try and you know talk shit to me like that's not the, some and some tool fucking talk shit to me. Uh, on my Instagram about uh, me talking about the Conor McGregor and Khabib thing because remember I told you guys oh the that, backstory with yeah there's a crazy backstory so, talking yeah and so I I fucking got some of that mixed up like it wasn't like the 9/11 tie-in was tied into uh, a different guy than I think I referenced and so okay. so my facts weren't fucking perfect which I don't think I, did I say it like that was I being like when I was telling you it was a convert I thought it was more conversational no, yeah. like trying to explain it you guys wasn't more super to specific it. you're just bringing up that fact that there was more to the story plus right. who cares right, right. Yeah, so yeah. anyway but I, I mean I do want to make sure that I get my shit straight and I don't want people like I don't I'm not trying to spread bad rumors so there's a guy who does a great YouTube channel it's called MMA on point we put the link in the show notes of the show where I've discussing that now, so I know Jackie will update those show notes so you guys can find that. But you can watch that, and the guy does a great 15-minute breakdown, and he literally takes every piece that he talks about and then kind of tells the back story of where... I want you guys to watch it because I watched it again just to see you know where I fucked up. And man, dude, Connor, you'll, you'll have a whole new respect for Connor. This motherfucker went so deep... On Khabib and and like his family, his friends, his relations, the psychological. Stuff. Oh, dude, and you don't catch it in the when you're listening. It's like a mental terrorist. When you when you're listening to the press conference and he's like throwing shit and he's talking shit and he's saying calling him names and he's calling stuff out like you're just laughing and it's like oh there's a jab oh but if you actually unpack everything that like what he's going after like dude he is like. He does serious research, and he's known for this already. He's already known for an athlete that kind of does his homework on his competitors, and he uses that. Mm. And the the rumor was that he went deeper on Khabib than he's ever gone on anybody else. And so watch the uh, – I'll share it with you guys. It'll be in the show notes. Now, what does that tell you? Hmm. If he went deeper in terms of his research on Khabib – Because he was Khabib, scared, bro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He's most, yeah, yeah. He fought probably he's most threatened biggest by Biggest threat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. In, in, in fact, if I would use that against him if I was his opponent. You know, I'd be like, oh, interesting. I can tell you're afraid of me because yeah. you went real deep to find that out yeah I, but i mean it was i was i was fascinated by it i got some of my facts mixed up so to correct to correct that it's in the show notes so you guys can go and listen to an expert mm-hmm. who fucking dives into all that shit. i still think the best shit talker of all time was muhammad ali i don't think anybody well, will ever see, come close. see i hate when we get into debates like this this is like the mm-hmm. the greatest boxer of all time the greatest football player of all time when you do, the original person should always you get the respect, bro. He used to come out and, and make poems. Right. I don't care. He would, re, he would make up. I don't poems. care, bro. What <laughs> Connor? The, the shit talking that Connor does is mean. A, he's just mean. No, he's he's good. Dude. Yeah, but he's mean. When Muhammad you, Ali wasn't mean. He would you come watch, out. And he would, you watch this MMA video I, I sent over to you guys. You watch that and you tell me that you still think that he is because yeah. the level that of shit talking. I mean, you're, Muhammad Ali was the original, the first. So the creativity of that, like you get extra credit for that, right? Yeah. For being the first, like. Conor McGregor wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Muhammad Ali doing that first, right? So you have to pay homage to that guy for that. But at the same token, 
you, he's evolved it. He's evolved yeah. it to a yeah. whole another. Bro, the motherfucker threw a dolly through a Dude, window. You, and you, <laughs> that's not, yeah. But that's what I mean. It's just that's just more. It's not necessarily evolved. It's just uh, what's the word to another level, if you will, in terms of intensity. <laughs> it's escalated. Yeah, it's escalated. Mike Tyson was a terrible shit talker. I mean, <laughs> he was he, my favorite because it was just like it didn't make any sense. He didn't know what he was gonna say. I'm, I'm, gonna, eat, I'm gonna eat your children. Yeah, I'm gonna eat your children. <laughs> if someone like, said what? that to me, I'd call the fight off. Yeah. Like, I'm okay. I'm cool. Like, oh my god, yeah, this you, guy is an animal. I love that shit. Yeah, too, wanna, though. I love. That. You want to eat my yeah. kids? Yeah. I mean, let's be honest though. He's already an intimidating. It's impetuous. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he like makes words up and shit. Oh, uh, no, it's my favorite. That's the worst. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Tyson. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, bro, in his prime. Tyson was the f- most frightening. Yeah, but dude, like you wouldn't I've make that's that's the sad part now is like, you'll see him on uh like like the roast of like the Comedy Central and all these things and people like you know like make fun of him and shit. I'm like you're making fun of Mike Tyson. Yeah, he'll kill you. He would fucking like like explode your head with yeah. like <laughs> one punch. Is you there know? is there anybody that could touch him in his prime? I mean the, the guy the scariest human being in the world. I at love one boxing. Point. Yeah. I love boxing and I watch all kinds of old boxing films and new boxers and I watch MMA. And nobody to this day for me, and I'm not being of because because Tyson was during my era. That's I don't give a shit about that. Yeah. I'd never seen anybody move like that with that kind of speed, power, nah, and balance. No, it doesn't no. make physics sense. No, yeah. scientifically impossible to be able to move that way. He did. No, no, he it's, was pure fast. He, he was special, dude. Yeah. He was he was special. And I I think if you you watch some of his documentaries they've done and like interviewing fighters who fought him, that they admit like nobody was more intimidating and, and scary to get in the ring with than that guy. <laughs> yeah. Like that, oh, yeah. talk about like just scaring the fuck out of men, like not wanting to take that fight. Oh, it's fucking frightening. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and then the guy throws in statements like, "I'll eat your children." Eat your children. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, dude, like if, I fucking believe this yeah, guy. You know? yeah, like, I, I do. Was, if he doesn't oh. knock me out, he's gonna eat my kids. Like, what do I do here? Oh, <laughs> like, listen, you're gonna stay with Inanna and Grandpa you know, <laughs> for the weekend Damn. until this all blows over. Dude, I was reading uh, an article yesterday about in PubMed. Probably no, it wasn't PubMed. Man. Uh probably GQ magazine? Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. GQ. Does that even exist still? I don't know. Does it? I, I uh, uh probably the most terrifying genetic disorder I've ever heard pu- mutation that I've ever heard in my entire life. What? So this is crazy. This is so here's what happens. The name of this disorder, I told Justin about this yesterday, is fatal familiar familial insomnia. It's oh, an extremely yeah. rare condition. So and there's only been twenty four reported cases of sporadic uh, FFI, which is you know fatal familial insomnia, uh, which r- that we've ever had uh, and, and you know recorded, and basically what it ha- happens and check out how crazy this is. I'm going to read what they wrote in the article. Typically, one day in middle age, the sufferer finds that he or she has just begun to sweat. A look in the mirror will show that their pupils have shrunk to pinpricks. Oh my god! And that they're holding their head in an odd, stiff way. Constipation is common. When women suddenly enter menopause and the men become impotent. The sufferer begins to have trouble sleeping and tries compensating with a nap in the afternoon, but to no avail. Blood pressure and pulse become elevated. Body is in overdrive. Over the ensuing months, they try to sleep, closing their eyes, but they never, ever fall asleep. Oh, my God. Within 12 to 18 months, they die. That's terrifying. They die. 18 to 12 months? They die. They literally don't sleep. They can't, not even for ten minutes. What a crazy! Did they try like any like drug intervention? That's a good question because I'm thinking like, would it be beneficial to put them on like general anesthesia? Yeah, exactly, right? Or something like that, Just like to get knock, them to recover or you, something. And what happens before they die is they because what when you don't sleep, you 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 lose your mind. You literally lose your mind. Oh, they start yeah. hallucinating. They start you Probably know into psychosis. Just yeah. like, how how rare is it? It's extremely rare. There's only twenty four. There's only been 24 recorded cases in history. Fuck, dude. You imagine dying like that and, and knowing, like, just being like, I just oh, can't. That's horrifying. The yeah, question would be like, is how, how many, like, uh, suicides are that before that even gets there? Because I would think that would be the case, right? I could see people killing themselves before you even get to that point where it kills you. No, no. They were talking about 12 to 18 months before that actually kills that's you. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying how many people- Would want to just kill themselves? Yeah, huh. potentially. So if there's 24 recorded cases, these are 24 cases of people that have tried to fight it and, mm-hmm. try, and whatever, and they eventually die from it. Mm-hmm. But how many people- yeah. That ended up taking their own lives were maybe possibly battling something like this, and they just fucked this after yeah. after well, a week. I, of, I'm sure the hallucinations must have been insane, right? Because right? I mean, if you're not 
sleeping, at some point, like your brain must want to go into the dream state. Yeah, because there's a difference between insomnia, where you're sleeping a few hours every night and you're sleep deprived, and literally never sleeping. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. That's crazy. Dude, think, speaking of uh, sleeping and stuff, uh, I have. I actually just started to use the Ned pretty consistently, and I've actually just started giving it to the boys. Oh, yeah. And I don't, like, you know, I'm big on waiting until I've done a few times. It's only been twice now. So how much do you you end up giving them? So we just put a a full dropper in their food. Okay. Yeah. And we, you know, for us, like, it's, it's, this is going to be a hard thing to measure to be certain about it. But whenever I take the boys, like, here, like, when we bring them to the Mm -hmm. studio, you know, they have a really hard time, like, relaxing and calming down, and, and they, they're, you know, panting all over the place. They're excited. They're in a new place. Yeah. And so the last two times that we've brought them brought them here, we've done that. And Katrina and I have noticed that it only takes them about 10 minutes to settle down, and then they're laying down, and they're chilling, and they're- Really? Yeah, so- And that's a big difference versus- yeah, Oh, a big, big, big difference, because before, I'd have them here for four or five hours, and the entire time, they're wound, you know, that? <laughs> panting all crazy, all right. and like, it just- So it, 10 minutes, and they're chill. Yeah, yeah, only about 10 minutes of that. So that's happened twice now. So it's happened twice where I have actually made sure that I've given them the, the, the Ned uh, CBD oil in their food before they come over here. And I do it just like right before we feed them, right before we walk them, and then we come over, then we come over here. And both times they've been good. That's so, so awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to do it a few more times, make sure for sure that's where I'm getting that response. And then I'll actually not do it so I can see uh, how much of a difference. So Maybe I'll re- give one to one and not to the other one. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. Although the calm one might calm down the other one. It will, or the other way around. Oh, so yeah. what tends to happen with them, individually they're really good, but the like they're they both have anxiety, so the combination of two they heighten each other. They, so sometimes Katrina will walk them individually because they're easy they're easier to deal with one at a time mm. because the other they they vibe off of each other's energy. Yeah. It's really a trip. Like you take Mozzie by himself, I can take Mozzie unleashed and walk him anywhere and he'll just be right on my hip. He's cool, he's chill. But Bentley is so like anxious and mm-hmm. wants to be in everything that when he's with Mozzie, he causes Mozzie to be the same way too. So it's like they vi- they definitely vibe off each other's energy. Well, ever since we started working with Ned um, and we mentioned that, I've gotten uh, maybe three three DMs from people who said that they've used it on their dogs to be effective. And here's a th- here's my my point of view with that because when your dog is anxious and you go to the vet, they prescribe them benzos. You know, yeah. they prescribe them Xanax or whatever. Yeah, I have that stuff for them. Which is you know, here's the problem with those drugs. First, they're highly addictive, and they if you give them if you give people or if when people use those drugs consistently, when they go off, the rebound of anxiety can be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. It could be absolutely terrible yeah. because your body starts to develop a tolerance. So I'm assuming that the same thing would happen to a, a pet. Um, and CBD is, I mean, super non-toxic. You know, there's other cannabinoids in there because it's full spectrum hemp extract. Yeah. It's immunomodulating. So if your dog has any kind of autoimmune type issues, it's probably good also. Yeah. And it's it's just, it's an oil. You know what I mean? I also notice a difference personally because I was already trying it myself. Um, I noticed the difference by what uh, Dr. Cabral, uh, Cabral said about holding it under your tongue for like 30 seconds. I was going to mention that because I had told Courtney about that. And so like she started taking it like that and noticed the difference because like anxiety has been a really big issue ever since, you know, uh, you, my dog died and, like, and she had to watch the whole thing. And it's been this like traumatic thing she's had to work through. Between that and the gold juice for like Organifi has been like a, a lifesaver as far as like at night is when it really ramps up. And so, uh, you know, she'll make that in a tea and, uh, you know, put some lemon in there and like have a nice like tea. The net or the actual, orga- what is she? Oh, she- the Organifi. Oh, uh, like gold a tea? juice, like a tea. Yeah. Oh. So she goes gold. With, with she- hot water. So she hot goes, water. so she goes, uh, the Ned, and then she takes the gold juice at the same well, time. Well, I just, yeah, she just started taking the Ned because like I'd. Again, like I, I was like testing it out, but I think we were just like, you know, doing the droplets and, and then taking it real fast. But then he said to hold it in your mouth for like two minutes. Yeah, I think and he it said. Difference. I think he said something like thirty percent of it's destroyed in the gut if you so allow it to get absorbed through the capillaries under the tongue. Yeah, yeah. and you'll absorb more of it. So I've been doing that since so, we yeah, had, so him, had him in the studio. Speaking of organic, have we not got the pumpkin? The pumpkin spice is live, right? 
Yeah, it should be. The gold. They have a gold juice. Pumpkin spice is out. I have no idea. I have to mm. look. Yeah, could someone put a, a reminder to Rachel to have her email? I would like. Somebody some said of, they had a new product too called Pure or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So what is that? <clears throat> it's a. I think it's a nootropic. No. Yeah, yeah. They really? got it in the nootropic space. No way. Yeah, yeah. They did. I saw the. Wa- I have, so we haven't tried it yet. No, we uh, haven't tried that, and we haven't tried the pumpkin spice. So if we could get Rachel to get on that and have her sent, I mean, I think we should have that stuff. Right. Mm. So, Dude, so it's kind of funny though. Like so, uh, back on the anxiety. <laughs> Sort of topic, um, I guess in the news, there's this lady that, uh, you know how you get like certain pets to comfort you on the plane, mm-hmm. right? And so like they're allowing this and it's kind of interesting to see what they do allow and what they don't allow. And so this lady uh, just thought it'd be a great idea to have an anti-anxiety pet that was a squirrel. Whoa, what? Yeah. What? That's the worst, <laughs> that's the worst animal. It's like a little squirrel. tree vermin. That she brought on the plane and, and freaked everybody out, and uh, they basically had to to kick her off the plane with this animal, and everybody's got pissed because it was like two hour delay. But uh, what was funny was, let's see, I'm gonna read like the ones that are actually acceptable and ones that they've deemed that aren't acceptable, right? So, uh, oh, okay, so acceptable animals for the plane, the animals you can can and can't bring assuming, on on flights. I'm so you can bring snakes, dogs. I'm assuming snakes are not on. Yeah, there. so that's one. I saw that movie. Dogs, cats, <laughs> too and but and mini horses. What the fuck? You can bring a mini horse on, on a, a plane. plane. I had no idea. Well, we bring we bring a, a, a medium horse, you know, Justin, yeah. on the plane. Well, we yeah, there? I eat a lot of hay. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> A little combination dumb. of dad jokes there. Yeah, it was dumb. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, pretty much everything else. Uh, peacocks, hamsters, snakes, not okay. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Just peacocks. just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> but who brings a fucking squirrel on a plane? Like That's what I want to know. A squirrel, if, okay, if emotional- Could you train it? Well, I was going to say- if, Imagine if that got loose and just- <laughs> Well, think about it this way. If emotional states of mind had an animal sponsor representative, like if you had an am- animal to represent- an emotional state of mind, the squirrel would for sure win for anxiety. That is the most <laughs> anxious animal right? I've ever seen in my entire life, which is why I don't trust it them. It like inflicts anxiety on everybody. Well, they just they, they are anxiety personified right. in, in, mm-hmm. in an animal. What's it called when you, something's, uh, what is it called when it's a... Uh, Squirrely. Stop being squirrely. No, no. Well, that's what oh, I mean. Someone, no, I know people you use that. Stop being squirrely. I mean, that's where that, that comes from, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you give human characteristics to an animal. Animal to, uh, I don't remember. Oh, there it is right there. Uh, I know what you're trying to say. Oh, yeah. Click on pure. Let's look at the ingredients real quick. The Organifi pure. pure. Look at this. We're sponsored by them. We don't even know what the fuck they got coming out. It says hey, pure. That's great. O- like open that new, up. Who's dropping, products. The, who's dropping the ball there? Open uh, that up so I can read what's in there. Let's find out what they got going you can't on can't do here. it. To, oh, oh, here we go. Uh, so the brain support proti- proprietary blend has coconut water powder, lion's mane. Oh, shit. Neurofactor coffee fruit extract. So it's probably got a little caffeine in it. And then it's got uh, baobab. I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that. Apple cider vinegar powder. Oh, yeah, baobab. Prebiotic vegetable fiber, enzymes. Interesting. So the lion's mane seems to be the main ingredient. I'd like to find out how much caffeine is in there uh, specifically, because I love combining lion's mane with uh, with caffeine. That's a great. Yeah. That's a good time, if yeah. you will. <laughs> that's a good time. It is a good time. <laughs> it's a good. Time. It's almost a drug. Clarity. Yeah. That's why they call it clear. Huh? What now, no, Sal? Pure, the pure. Oh, when pure, when you see bad. a proprietary blend that's one point four. It, I mean, and then you see, go back up, Doug. Sorry, one point four grams. Mm-hmm. One, two, three. Well, I guess there's only three or four ingredients. In yeah. That. So that's a decent amount. I so. know a lot of people say talk shit about proprietary blends, and a lot of people, you know, defend them. Um, well, we talk shit about them too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's if a, I did, if look if we didn't know the company right, Organifi, right. and if I didn't know you know the people running it, I would. I, I don't personally like proprietary blends, but Organifi uh, is a is a pretty good integrity uh, you know on on our best well everything that we've checked them on or asked them about they've been able to provide for us so i feel good about it that's right you know i i I always wonder what the the strategy is for a company like that that's doing that is you know is it and i get it with something like a nootropic because it is such a competitive market right now in there so if you've found a killer combination of x y and z that you don't want to disclose that completely and it's and its effects on it right so i get that i get that a little bit because i understand that that's right now the hustle is everybody is jumping in the nootropic area and you know hustling on that which I don't know. We'll see if I use this. Yeah. This uh, is uh, this is I I'm for sure 
like big on the green juice. I occasionally yeah. use the red juice. I love the gold juice. I think you'll like protein this. Powder. I think you'll like this because you, you and Doug in particular both feel shitty on things that are neutrop- quote unquote nootropics. Like I've yeah. given you guys all the race attempts. Yeah, well, it's mainly the synthetic versions, right? Yeah, you, you, but, yeah. you don't like rhodiola, Adam. Right. Uh, neither do I. That fucks me up too. It makes me feel weird. Um, so th- it would be interesting to see. And then, of course, you threw up on uh, what's that one? Supplement uh, uh, Alpha, Alpha Brain. Brain. Yeah, Alpha Brain made you puke because probably because you took like five times the <laughs> recommended. It's way it. more than the recommended. Was it that much about. more? It wasn't that much, bro. More. You took uh, at least five like, servings. Yeah, at least oh, five dude. servings. Like like two big minutes. chugs, you know, before we worked out, and then afterwards, bro. I just remember looking at your. There face. was some like spiritual warfare stuff going on there. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You were in the spirit realm. I, I mean, I'll be I honest. Know, I was but, like, you know, there's like a uh, demon possessed me. You know dude. what's funny? <laughs> <laughs> this is for the for the <laughs> listeners. If you, because I know that they didn't they record that interview on YouTube also. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think so it's out so there somewhere. If, if you if you can find the these, most quiet Adam ever was. Yeah, if you can find this on an interview where we were getting interviewed, you can clearly see the moment that hit too me. many alpha brains hit Adam because he yeah, was. Yeah. He was talking, and then all of a sudden, he was he like, he, like uh, that's the sound his face made. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly what it was. Now his face pulled back from the mic. Like, I remember when we first watched it, you, you, there is a point, and it's not that far in, where you can kind of clearly see I'm just not feeling great. You know? <laughs> yeah. no. And then we're driving home, and I'm like, <laughs> and I don't. You blame me, you fucker. <laughs> yeah. Remember this motherfucker? Uh, oh, Sal, you fucker. Uh, I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? You're fucking falling asleep halfway through the podcast. Oh, my God. It's all good. I Plus, love that how was, we four by four it all over the place. Well, that was, that was what, right? That was one of <laughs> oh, my. Oh, shit, we did. We huh? did, yeah. We, we did. We always do that. Yeah, remember? Shh, why are you going to no, so Did you roll some of the bus? They don't know. Roll some of the bus like that. That's it. We drove over all the. No, dude, don't roll me under the bus like that. It's fun. I'll deny. Deny, 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 yeah, deny. Yeah. Those cameras didn't happen. <clears throat> well, I just think that was a uh, that was one of the first time. Was that the first or second time we had interviewed with Kyle over there? One first, second. Or, it was the second time. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I still feel like we were we were figuring our, our flow out. You know, there's some people that we interview with instant chemistry. Just the conversation flows. They interview us well. Then there's some people that we do interviews with, and I feel like. When we're the ones driving it, it's a better interview. When and then when they're in the and when they're in the driver's seat, it's not as good of an interview. Mm-hmm. And I think that was part of us feeling that out with him back then. Is just like I felt like we were at a place where uh, I was like, man, I think that could have gone somewhere else. And mm-hmm. I remember I was pissed. Off. I know why I was pissed off. I was mad because I was like, before we went into that interview, I was like, can we please? Hang out with on it guys and not talk about ayahuasca for once, <laughs> for one time, <laughs> one time. Like no. as much as I love talking about it, like and learning about it, it's mm. like I'm over it. Yeah. Like and, and then it comes up. Yeah, then it came around. I'm like uh. fuck, you know. <laughs> so the combination of too much alpha brain ayahuasca talk made me vomit. <laughs> 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 the okay. demons inside. Yeah, yeah, that's came right. Out. A. So uh, I got this um, this this article sent to me the other day, and it was just it was published uh, recently. So this year. <laughs> and it's in the Lancet, uh, excuse me, the Lancet, and oh. the title of it is the Slit? Uh, no Lancet. Yeah, uh, asso- the association of dairy intake with cardiovascular disease and mortality in 21 countries from five contents continents. This is a prospective cohort study. So this is a they've taken all kinds of studies on dairy and put them together to see if there's an association <clears throat> between dairy. Cardiovascular disease and mortality. What do you think they found, Justin? I don't want to hear this. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> such a like you say, such look a at this. Dick. The last one, I'm, I'm admitting that I'm hard headed. So what does Sal do? He goes like, I'm going to dive okay. deeper and get this motherfucker. <laughs> no, no, dude. Dairy. Come on, bro. You got to trust me. First all right, of all, all right. What? What have I always said about dairy? If you can tolerate it and it's then from a good fine. source, it's probably good for you. <laughs> right. Okay. The dairy, ready for this? Dairy consumption, this is from all these studies, dairy consumption was associated with lower risk of mortality and major cardiovascular disease events in a diverse multinational cohort. So if you can tolerate it, so you can't because you shit yourself the other day. (laughs) Hey, man. I, I, I'm trying to decipher whether or not that was from the almond butter, you know what I mean, still, <laughs> or <butter>. yeah, <laughs> peanut butter. Yeah, right. Hey, speaking of studies, can you break down or share, because I just didn't read it all, um, and I saw you were tagged, and I also saw you commented. Uh, I saw Lane with his monster drink that he was representing oh, again. What was he? What was he ranting about? In because I know that we just recently, t- I believe it was Doctor. Cabral, right? Yeah, you know that we talked about this. 
And I, and I, I feel like that was Lane poking at us. I thought I didn't take care. Did you to see look. my comment underneath? And I did see that you said Lane will never let go of his fucking energy drinks. And then I called him a, a fuck face or something. Like oh, that. you did? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, I did see you call him a fuck yeah, we're face. We're on that level now. I mean, right, right, right. We could, we could jab. Which that's what I felt that's like. Great. I thought it was a friendly jab from him to us because I thought that was it was interesting. It came out just after we did the Doctor yep. Cabral episode. So right. did he? Did he make any good points? Here's or, the problem. <clears throat> Here's the problem that I have. Well, he was challenging the bacteria because it was in like uh, like the petri dish, okay, right? So here's what happens when you have this belief system, and he always is against the the zealots and this, that, and the other. It's what Lane does or says, but I think he's he's really biased because it's almost like he's aiming to poke. He wants to poke more holes at the studies, even though there's lots of evidence that's mm. coming out now that's saying artificial sweeteners are probably not good for your your microbiota. But he's, it's almost like he's trying to poke holes in it, mm-hmm. in these things, to reinforce his previous belief. Like, in other words, what he's saying is, until I see super concrete, incredibly, right. you know, uh, backed up evidence, then I'm going to continue to believe that, you know, right. artificial sweeteners like until have- Until right after I drink my monster, I die, uh, you're not going to turn me into yeah, you know, one of them. Yeah, and I, you know, I get what he's saying. The, the studies aren't, like, super clear and associative but there's enough of them to show that they're probably not good for you long term that's all probably not a good idea to always have them all the time uh in, you know to for your health and so he's just he's just poking holes in it he's finding things to poke holes in it like oh this is this is there's a, there's six times the amount that you'll drink and right. this is in vitro not in vivo and right. and all that other stuff well but, this is the thing too i i've always felt about uh not always, I should say, later on in my career, as the deeper you dive into studies, it's you can always poke holes. Yeah. Yeah. There's such an indiv- individual variance with, with humans. Like there, there, there's, never, there's never ever They're studies. They're never where, perfect. Yeah, you never see like a perfect controlled situation and 100% of the outcome comes like this. It's always like, oh, 60-something percent of all people that did this, this, and this had these types of reactions. Like, well, what does that fucking tell well, us? Well, in medicine- and They're not going to cherry-pick the data that they want to see, right. you know, all that stuff. And, yeah. and, in, and, and in medicine, you know, the number one rule in, in medicine is first do no harm, okay? So when you're giving people advice, the first thing that you're, especially, and I, I take this as a fit, fitness professional, is I think to myself, first, I'm not going to, you know, I want to do no harm. So what that means, I'm always going to err on the side of, of safe and healthy versus erring on the side of, well, it might be bad for you, but maybe it's probably not. So why don't we go ahead and give this a try? This is people's approach with supplements. This is their approach with like SARMs. Like SARMs are this thing that people are using. This is un, you know, barely studied, you know, uh, substances that you can buy on the gray market, technically black market, but you know, gray market online. And what are people saying? Well, you know, the study, so far no conclusive evidence is showing that it's bad. And it's like, well, I, I get that. But if you're really a fitness professional, the first rule is, you know, do no harm. And can you can you honestly say that SARMs are 100% safe and probably not going to have any side effects? No, you can't. We don't have that evidence. So I would not recommend them. Same thing with uh, with the artificial sweetener. So yeah. right. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. All right, first question is from Clay B. Williams. When changing rep ranges, should I also change the type of exercise in the routine as well? Mm. That was a cool question. Yeah, I liked it mainly because of like when do you change the types of exercise? Like when do I go from a back-loaded squat to a front-loaded squat and make sure that that's part of my routine? Uh, This is something I I tend to assess every now and then. Like if I've been uh, too focused on a certain type of lift and trying to, you know, enhance that that skill of it and and the strength there. And uh, so for me, it's kind of a routine, you know, every three to to four months. Like I, I tend to like really assess like where I've put most of my efforts uh, within the major compound lifts and like where to incorporate like a zercher squat, for instance, or, you know, a, a front loaded squat. Like when do you guys, uh, you know, incorporate like more of those unconventional type lifts? Well, when I, if I'm thinking in terms of, so bodybuilders tend to change the exercises a little bit more frequently. 
strength athletes maybe a little less frequently. Mm -hmm. I like to change the rep ranges more than I like to change the exercises typically with myself and with with right. clients. So like if I'm looking at my routine as a three month program, I'll put the work, I'll put the exercises in there. Some will change, but some will stay. Like like a back squat might stay in there the whole workout. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get good at the back squat with low reps, moderate reps, and high reps. So I'm 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 just mastering and perfecting an exercise like the, like the squat through the different uh, rep ranges. But these are just these are two variables. There's more than two, by the way. There's more than just the rep ranges and the right, tempo. and the exercises. Yeah, there's yeah. there's all kinds of different um, variables <coughs> that you play period. with. Mm -hmm. And personally, I think it's smarter to change one variable at a time mm -hmm. and not change all of them at the same time. Because like anything, like if you look at science, for example, if you're trying to isolate what's giving you whatever effect, you can't change everything at the same time because you don't know what's doing what. So like if I'm trying to build my chest and I'm doing low rep phase, let's say it's a phase one of, of a, like a MAPS anabolic and my main chest exercises are incline barbell press and flat barbell press. And then the next phase I do a moderate rep range and I change the exercises and I notice some muscle growth, which one do I attribute the, the gains to? How do I know what my body's responding to? Because at the end of the day, one of your main goals with working out, especially if you, if you intend on doing it long term, is to find out what affects your body and how it affects your body. And once you learn that, then you can start messing with variables in a much, much smarter way. It's not haphazard. Because I think a lot of people, when they work out, they just, it's like they shake it up and then yeah. they, don't, they don't really know what's doing what or when to apply what. You know what I mean? I, I think that's really well said because... I do it differently, but I only do it differently because I've already put all the time and effort into teasing everything out to see like, oh, wow, when I do this with a rep range, it makes a difference. Oh, when I change these exercises, it makes a difference. I like to do this. I keep a a very staple, like the staple movements in there. Like you will, all of my programs, whether I'm, what, no matter what, and it's kind of how MAPS is designed when you think about it. Like I don't think we have a single MAPS program that doesn't have a barbell squat in it. Right. Do we? Do we no. I think every single program yeah, everyone, yeah. has a barbell squat in it, but we've messed with all the, all the different ways that you can manipulate intensity through tempo, through rep ranges, through different things like that. So I'm going to have my staple movements that I'm always going to kind of keep in my program, which have the most carryover. But then you have these other either, you know, isolation type exercises or, you know, mobility type of movements or multi-planar planar things that are you're adding in there. I, I think those type of exercises are the ones that I tend to manipulate this. And when I do it, I like to do both. I like to change the exercise and I like to change the rep. So I'll use an ex give you an example. So like we were doing... Uh, if I'm doing like split and I have like a leg day and like barbell back squats always in there, but then I have like a Bl Bulgarian split squat stance. Well, I'm getting ready to move into a new phase, which is going to change the rep range. I may also drop the Bulgarian squat and also now do lunges instead. Just because like I know there there's some carryover similarities, those movements. I know that when I change an exercise and the rep range, mm -hmm. I'm going to see more change, more adaptation because I'm changing more variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and I know that each of those now I could do just one and I could see some difference, especially if I'm trying to improve that skill. Now, if I'm new to Bulgarian split squats, I would advise what you said, Sal, which is keeping that in this routine, doing it low reps, right. doing it mid reps, doing it at high reps and continuing to improve the skill. Now, I like to think that I have, I, I've improved that skill pretty well. I feel very comfortable doing that. And so now I play with both variables at the same. I might even change tempo too. Mm -hmm. I might even decide that I'm going to do it and slow the tempo way down. I'm going to change the exercise mm -hmm. and I'm going to go slow and I'm going to change the rep range because I know that it's something that will shock my body. Right? That's right. More, the, the better, <clears throat> the more advanced someone is and the better they are at controlling their body through exercise, the more they can get away with changing the exercises uh, more frequently. Yeah. I, I think too, like to your point of strength athletes, kind of looking at it like a little bit uh, longer in between, like changing up uh, your, your types of exercise. Like for me, like the, why I thought this was interesting because right now I'm, I'm starting to focus more on front loaded squats and I have exhausted almost m most, most variables that I could add and apply to your regular backloaded squat. So uh, you know, I've I've gone down and I've held 
uh, you, you know, at the bottom position, I've done uh, all kinds of different uh, tempos. I've done all kinds of, um, you know, different rest periods, um, you, you know, with, with the backloaded squat. And I've, I've used uh, variable resistance. And, you know, I've, I've pretty much exhausted, like, the different ways that I could approach, you know, the backloaded squat. And now I'm moving on from, like, three to four months or three to four weeks, excuse me, of just, you know, trying to focus on, uh, you know, the front-loaded squat specifically specifically just to focus on like, honing in on the skill of it, honing in on the skill of it and like getting better in the mechanics of it, going through that process and then seeing now how that carries over into the back So of the funny squat. that you, so that just shows you how we're all different, right? Mm-hmm. Like that makes so much sense to me coming fr- from you because you are more geared strength wise and it makes more sense because I'm more geared towards aesthetics and looking different and change. So mm-hmm. I'm looking, I care less by changing these variables to see a performance gain, mm-hmm. I care more that uh, to see some sort of change in my physique. And I know that changing both the exercise and and tempo and repetitions, although may not have as much carryover for improving my strength in a, su- a certain movement, but it will have the most carryover for change in my body because I'm throwing so many variables. But it's it. also, we have to say this, you move well. So you can pick different exercises and mm-hmm. you can work the muscle. Most people listening right now should probably have more of a Justin approach right. because they just don't have the skill. I agree. I agree. A, a lot of the benefit that you're going to get from an exercise comes after you learn the skill of doing the exercise, which requires a lot of practice. Yeah. So if you're just doing a look, here's the, like if you're not good at all these exercises, if you're the average lifter, you switch them up all the time. Your body's not you're not uh, coordinated enough. You're not able to generate enough force to maximize that exercise. Like if you've never barbell squatted before, let's just say you have decent mobility. Let's say you're a beginner, but you still have good mobility, so you could get under a bar and squat. The gains that you're going to get from the squat are going to happen after you get good at doing the squat. That's when we're really able to push the exercise because in the beginning, it's going to be getting used to the movement. It's going to be used to getting the control, the power output. A lot of the strength gains initially come from your central nervous system and aren't necessarily coming from the fact that you're building more muscle. It's after you get good at the exercise and then you can really push it that you start to see those gains. And so that's why it's important to stick to an exercise for a long time. Get good at it. Allow your body to get good at it before you you mix it up. But if you've been working out for a long time and you're like Adam or even like any of us who've been working out for a long time, we can pick out or pick up most exercises, most I'd say traditional exercises, and I can do an, a movement and feel the target muscle and have good control. Right. Just I've been working out forever and I've done all of them. But the average person, if they've never done a, a you know a dumbbell pullover, I mean, you're, the first three weeks of doing a dumbbell pullover, just getting the movement down, just getting yeah. the movement down. No, that, that's such a good yeah. point, and it, and it reminds me of why I don't like um, I don't like some fitness professionals that that post random exercises on their Instagram all the time. And the reason why I don't I don't like that is because I'm 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 fully aware of the the average person that's tuning into that. Mm-hmm. That speaks to me as an advanced lifter who's been lifting forever, and I go, oh, that's a cool, unique exercise that I could throw in and incorporate in my team. But what I know from training so many people is that most people, they haven't even performed the staple movements really well. So you throwing this exercise that is very mechanically challenging for them, you're not doing as much good as you think it is. Now, it for uh, you know the novelty reason, you we're all attracted to it because it's mm-hmm. like, oh shit, look what he's doing that, you know, jump lunge exercise with that Smith machine thing. That's like, whoa, that's really cool. I'm going to try that. It's like, wait a second. You can't even do a fucking a split stance squat very well. Yeah. Why are you doing something weird Your like that? Plus it's is shitty to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Plus it's 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 bullshit marketing. Hey, yeah. you know, buy my program. Do all these do, you know, 500 different exercises over the course of 3 months and they're all different. Your workout's different every single time. Therefore, you need to keep tuning in to get all these new. It, it doesn't work. Look, I'll tell you what. If you yeah. took two groups of it's the, all marketing. If you took two groups of people and did they ran this test, and they're the average lifter. So not super experienced. It's just the average person trying to work out. And group one, you give them random exercises for each body part every time they worked out. So every time they hit chest, it was three brand new exercises that they're not really good at. And the other group did the same exact three ex- chest exercises every single week. And you combine and you, you compared them over a three-month period. The group that did the same exact three exercises all three months would build more muscle and strength mm-hmm. in their chest because they were giving themselves time to build and master the skill of whatever exercises that they did 
Whereas the other group is is fucking every time they're they're in there to work out their chest, it's a brand new movement. They, look, it took me. I can't I can't tell you how long it took me before I was able to really feel a lat pull down in my lats, mm-hmm. or be able to feel a row properly, or to feel do a shoulder press to where I'm actually feeling what I'm supposed to do. It took a while of practice, and so changing exercises up all the time. Probably not a great strategy for most people. It's probably better to stay with them for a longer period of time, go through the different rep ranges within the same exercises, and maybe give yourself a few months before you decide to, to switch it all up. Next question is from Dwayne Hofer. Should you stretch after working out? Didn't we just have a really good discussion with somebody around this? Uh, uh-huh. Was it Pakolsky or was it who was it that we had this conversation? It might have been Cabral, no? Didn't we just have Cabral. Dr. Cabral? Yeah, because we were talking uh, about central nervous system and yeah. how yeah, we're trying to solidify Dude, was Cabral? that yeah. signal. Yep, the, 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 the traditional long hold static stretching that we all learned in gym class where you, you get in a stretch, you hold the stretch for 30 seconds, uh, you try to relax in the stretch and loosen things up and relax. That is best applied at the end of the workout. It is not yeah. a good way to, pre-war- to warm up before no. your workout. Now, why is it good post-workout? Long hold static stretching is parasympathetic. Oh, that it was. You're right. It yeah. was. Car- that's yeah, this yeah, is what yeah. we were talking about because mm-hmm. we we're talking about how important it is to get into that state when After we're trying. Workout, right? Yeah, because mm-hmm. working out is sympathetic, and you want to be sympathetic. Like when I'm working out and I'm lifting weights and I'm trying to build muscle, my goal. I want to be sympathetic. I want. Music that's going to make me feel amped. Explain. I want caffeine. Ex- explain that a little bit deeper for the audience that doesn't understand that, because that's a term that we throw around quite a bit, and it's like, what do you assume that wh- people know? Right, right, right. right. So, sympath- the, the the central nervous system has these two operating systems, if you will, um, and just, just this is just to simplify because it's much autonomic, but that's autonomic, separate. right? Yeah. And these are, these are two. Uh, this is very simplified, but generally true. The sympathetic. Uh, you know, s- operating system of your of your central nervous system is this fight or flight, uh, high energy, go go go. Uh, it's this awake and alert state of your central nervous system. The parasympathetic uh, state of the nervous system is relaxed, repair, rebuild, sleep is more uh, more in the state. Uh, but this is when your body is repairing and rebuilding. Now, when you it. say that, it it reminds me why, again, why I love the original analogy that we probably haven't said in a long time that you used to share all the time is like comparing the central nervous system as to an amplifier to your speakers. Now, when you say that, uh, so your muscles are your are your speakers. Your central nervous system is like your amplifier. And then when you start explaining it like that, I go, okay. So when I'm sympathetic, then it's like me cranking the juice up into my amplifier. Right. And then when I'm parasympathetic, it's like me turning the juice down. That's right. To my That's amplifier. Because right. think about it this way: when you're going into a workout, when you're lifting weights, and you're going in there to work out hard, right? You want to build muscle. What do you want? You want to be amped. You want to be psyched. You probably are listening to louder music. You're listening to music that's inspiring. You might take caffeine, which is sympathetic, right? That's stimulating that fight or flight response. And you're in there to go after it. You're going, in, you're going after it. After the workout, you, you're, now you're ready to, to re- repair and rebuild and recover. If you maintain that super amped feeling all the time, your body doesn't do a very good yeah. job of, of it rebuilding. It takes longer to facilitate uh, recovery, and that's why the parasympathetic state, the, it, the goal should be to be able to achieve that state you know, as soon as you can after a, a workout. That's right. It's the, the rest and digest uh, part of the, sympath- of, the, of the nervous system that they say. So post-workout's a great time to get on the floor and do these long hold stretches First off, uh, it's a it's a great way to get. First off, studies have shown that static stretches during or post, especially a heavy workout, may in fact uh, induce more muscle growth. You may actually build more muscle as a result. I know Ben Pikulski talks about this, uh, you know, in his workouts. Um, so there's that. But there's also the fact that long stretches tend to relax the body. And what you want to do after your workout, and this is why they, you know, this is one of the reasons why eating post workout. Again, we're splitting hairs here. But eating post-workout might be a good idea uh, for building muscle because it digesting is part of that parasympathetic. That's why after you eat a big meal, you kind of relax. We teach this in Maps Prime. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, this was this That's is the post prime. There's a whole protocol, yeah, for after workout, and it's funny because we try to highlight what most people already know, right? Have a warm up, have a cool down. Right. And, and like we've gone away from that process, but it's because it's been aimless and, right. and nobody really has like a, 
an idea of what the perfect protocol is for that. So we tried our best to really construct that in a way where we could you could individualize it based off of uh, you know how your body was responding and your joints were responding and you know what to sort of do after you had these types of intense workouts. Well, and when you say individualize, one of the things that you're explaining that I think maybe the audience doesn't understand is that. Every person is going to have these imbalances, right, that are that are going on their body. And that, the prime comes with a test, and it allows you to figure out those. Now, where do you work on your corrective stuff? Like, when would be a good time to sit in a 30-second or longer stretch? Well, guess what? After your workout, you're already trying to cool down and calm down. What a great time to work on these imbalances that you have. That's right. This the is tissue a, is very pliable. Yeah, you know, so you're getting like a – that's what people don't realize as much. We just kind of – glaze right over the 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 post workout like it's no big deal but it's like man this there's a good part of this that is very beneficial to you and it's multifaceted right if you have one i can work on corrective work that is going to help my po- overall posture which has carryover in itself and then two i'm going to get myself out of that sympathetic state into a parasympathetic state so i now can start to recover and then i'm also putting myself in a position to be ready like you said sal to rest and digest my food or my post workout yeah meal. and it, i mean some of my best absolute when i'm really when i have the time and when i'm really dedicated to my training cuz i work out all the time but i don't i'm not always at a level 10 in terms of pure focus on my workouts and routines and perfecting everything. It's usually around a seven or an eight just because of life. But when I'm really focused on maximizing my progress, all my workouts include a pre-priming session, which is what I do before my workout. But they all also include a post-priming session, which includes lots of static stretching. And the static stretching that I tend to do is I'll focus on the areas that I need more range of motion, but then I'll always stretch the, the the target muscles that I really worked hard, and I'll hold. And it's there's I swear it's such a great feeling. Like you work out your legs really hard, and you're done with your workout. Go sit in a thirty to sixty second quad stretch. Right. Mm-hmm. Go sit in a thirty to sixty second glute or hip stretch oh, or yeah. hamstring stretch. I sit in pigeon all the time and, afterwards. And come out of that, and then feel the pump kick in even more. It's like the muscles just you know blow up, and, and it feels amazing. And your range of motion is fucking awesome. Like I, I, my range of motion after a leg workout with the static stretching is ranges of motion that I, I can, I can't normally hit, and it feels really good. And then when I get in my car to drive home or I, I'm done with my workout, I feel like really calm and I feel really good instead of like finish the workout, rush to the car, get you know get get to work or whatever. You're pounding your shake on the way. Yeah, and I'm not really getting into that parasympathetic state. And I just notice recovery is better. I notice as a result of better recovery, better performance, the next time I work out, and of course that translates into into better gains, how big of a difference does what you do before and after your workout make? Well, if you're a total beginner, uh, doesn't make a huge difference, but it makes a significant well, difference. Well, this is, I tell you what, I you know, this is something that off air, Ben Pakolsky and I talked about when we were getting into the whole oxygen gym and those guys. And, you know, and when we first were, you know, speculating that, oh, they are on some new drugs out there, this and that. And he's like, no, not at all. I've been out there. I know all the guys. I know what they're doing. He goes, they're just finally putting a lot of uh, energy and focus on all every process. On these pieces. Yeah. Yeah, On these pieces that, you know, when you're not, when no one, no one is helping organize that for you, you just kind of, it's very easy to just not think about that. Like, oh, I got the, the, everyone puts so much energy on the food you need to eat and that training session, right? And even the, the greatest of bodybuilders, that's where most of your energy and focus on. But there's other aspects to increase performance and to increase your results that can get you to move the needle a little more. Now, that's a, an exaggerated example because these are the the top uh, echelon athletes that we're talking about. That's where you really see it. Right. That's right? that's yeah. where you can see something more visual and measurable. Like the yeah. a, the average person who decides, "Oh wow, I never put any time and energy to my post workout, so two or three workouts you try it and you think all of a sudden you're going to see a, your picture, you look in the mirror and go, "Oh my god, look at yeah. how like you're not going to see that." But it absolutely is is improving this process. It makes sure. a big difference. The, the thing you'll see the biggest impact is the what you do before your workout. Pre priming, oh, you'll yeah. just feel it right away. Yeah, your whole workout will change as a result. You'll know right away. You'll get into the exercise and be like, "Holy shit, I can squat so good, so right. fast." The post stuff, the after that stuff. Give it a couple months and and, and and measure your progress. If you're somebody that tracks, you'll see a, mm-hmm. a, a significant, a small but significant increase in improvement in your performance. Next question is from Carmen Alessa. Alzheimer's and dementia is very common in my family. How can I prevent getting it myself and how can I help the ones who have it reduce their symptoms? There's a, 
a very strong correlation, I should say, correlation with brain degenerative disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's and the inability of the brain to utilize glucose uh, as an energy source. Um, scientists are now, many scientists now are calling dementia and Alzheimer's, uh, you know, type three diabetes. Like it's, it's the result of the brain's it's like insulin insensitivity that may show up uh, in the brain rather than in the rest of your body. And when and because your brain utilizes, you know, per per weight, the brain utilizes more energy than almost anything else in your body. If you if you account for its size, it's like a, and that's because it's always processing and always working. Um, and you know, it has different forms of energy. And one of the main forms is is you know sugars and carbohydrates and starches and you know glucose. And when it's in, unable to use those uh, energy sources well, it's just not running well. And this is why you see Alzheimer's and dementia patients typically improve uh, when you put them on a ketogenic diet or when they're running on ketones, because now you've given them a kind of a different, you know, energy source, and and you've de- and you've increased their sensitivity to to insulin. So one of the first things you can do, and and I know uh, what's his name talks about this. Max Lugavere talks yeah, about I was this. You say Genius Foods is all about this. He talks about this all the time. Is you know avoiding the 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 heavily processed foods, avoiding uh, super high amounts of uh, of sugars because that can in, that can you know cause uh, insulin uh, issues, insulin sensitivity issues. Eating adequate healthy fats, um, and then there's another big part of this that's massive. Which is exercise. New stimulus, right? Yeah, well, exercise. For physically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like nothing, here's the thing, like the, one of the largest uh, users uh, in the body of glucose is muscle. And if you can st- build muscle, you're going to improve mm-hmm. your body's ability to use glucose. Mm-hmm. That's a fact. So lifting weights is, in my opinion, because look, you could do cardio and burn off, you know, glucose and burn that stuff off but it's a very manual way of, uh, of doing things and you're not going to build more muscles you're not increasing or, or making the engine larger that burns these things uh, resistance training does that lifting weights in my opinion is the single best form of exercise for preventing all these you know insulin type related issues like type 1 2 and 3 uh, diabetes which is alzheimer's and di- and dementia lift weights Make it so that your body utilizes and stores more of this stuff and make your body more sensitive to these things so you, you don't cause these problems. Plus, resistance training, you know, like all exercise, but especially resistance training because it's novel and so many different movements, stimulates uh, yeah. BDNF and the, and the development of these neural pathways. Well, that's what's interesting because, I mean, you've seen certain programs that I know that they've gotten a uh, flack for, like uh, for mentioning neuroplasticity and like that, you know, just just stimulating the brain uh, to learn new skills is, you know, sort of part of the process. But re- resistance training, and I know you stress this a lot, it provides so many different new skills, so many different uh, things to acquire uh, under tension, under load, which challenges the body in all new ways, uh, but then also does what you said as far as like insulin sensitivity and like building muscle. And there's just so many more benefits in that specific d- direction uh, for your brain to benefit from as well. Do you, know, do you know what the rates are on this? Are we increasing? Or are we decreasing? Do you know if we're seeing more cases? It's, wor- it's getting worse uh, because people's health is getting worse, but we're also getting uh, a larger amount of just older people. So the total rate has gone up. The total amount has gone up because yeah. we have the aging baby boomer population. Yeah. I mean, all look at, look at diabetes, all the, the, the three forms of diabetes, and I'm referring to the, the, the type three that I said as well, which is Alzheimer's and dementia. Type two diabetes, which used to be called adult onset, but now we see in children as well. And then of course the autoimmune you know form of, uh, of type one diabetes. Those are the, those are the biggest like risks for literally bankrupting us. That's how that's how bad it's it's starting mm. to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and Alzheimer's and dementia is are extremely expensive disorders. Like when you're, if you have aging parents, and they start to develop dementia and Alzheimer's, that's a it's, it's expensive to take care of them because they can't. It's not like somebody who can't walk, but they're but they have the mental capacity. Yeah. They can't do anything a, a, a lot of times, and it's it's a very expensive uh it's it's something that i would not wish on my 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 biggest enemy but how and how closely related is things like uh, parkinson's to that i mean how similar are the are the diseases do you know much about parkinson's i, I don't think they're 
related. I don't think they're related. Uh, I can't think of how they're related, but, but yeah. they are both neurological, you know, conditions. Um, Parkinson's. There's now a, a connection to um, the gut. There's actually a strong mm. connection now to issues in the gut, and there may be a bacteria that may be causing it in some people. Because I've been I've been on this like hunt forever, and I always talk to almost every you know nutritionist specialist that we have on here, and every doctor to try and like. It's my best friend has the has that the the dream thing that I forget the the what they call it. It's super rare where he has these where he acts out his dreams mm. and like it can be violent and it can be dangerous. He's jumped off his bed and there's been cases of people that mm. have tried to jump out a window and stuff like that and they're from their dreams. Like so it's a very rare case, but the uh the people that have it have like a ninety percent chance that they're gonna have Parkinson's later in life. Mm. Mm. And so I'm always like trying to send him research like related to to diet and the gut and things like that. And there's, you know, I, the, what I have found, like what I keep reading is a lot of the similar things that, you know, quote unquote would improve or, you know, reduce your your chances of Al- Alzheimer's is very similar to Parkinson's and they mm-hmm. all, and maybe that's just because it's a neurological thing. We don't know much about it's it. it's just what makes you healthier is going right. to be like overall health right. you know, will help you neurologically as well. You, you, you'd assume if you went through the same sort of protocol, like it, it should have some benefit, but it's interesting because, you know, most of these uh, diseases, like they have, have just immediately wrote off as genetic disorders like forever. And there was no real um, way to prevent it or, you know, like they, they didn't they didn't really have any idea of like what might, um, uh, you know, epigenetically sort of like uh, trigger some of these things. Well, one of the challenges with genetics when we say something like, oh, it, it must be in your genes is, you know, let's say you have a grandfather with Alzheimer's and then your dad gets Alzheimer's and then you get Alzheimer's and they're like, oh, there must be a genetic component Mm -hmm. one of the problems with that is it's hard to tease out the lifestyle that you've picked up from each other well especially when you're talking about families that's what i mean you know what do you normally you normally all eat kind of the same thing and that's what i mean so it may it may be more lifestyle than than anything else uh that's what makes it you know so difficult and it sucks so that everything is you know correlation right now and we can't prove anything for sure because it's really tough to talk to somebody like that. so i was just recently reading on the benefits of sauna use regular sauna use and regular sauna use is dramatically reduce uh rates of alzheimer's Mm. and dementia um and then even more benefits to it there is oh all all around all across the board mortality well then i would think for the benefits because we get with the, the red lights therapy i would think with the com- combination like the infrared sauna that we have that has the infrared and it's a sauna i think it's a double whammy because yeah. of the benefits for, with mitochondria and I stuff would, with the red light i therapy. would guess so the other thing is fasting i bet i i in my opinion i bet you fasting i bet you we could show a reduction hmm. first off when you fast for a prolonged period of time uh you're dramatically increasing your sensitivity to you know your, your insulin sensitivity sensitivity you're you're speeding up cell autophagy. You're probably your brain's probably getting rid of right. these buildups that you know can well, cause. Anecdotally, some of these you know, I felt like sharper, like coming out of a fast, and then you reintroduce food, and it just feels like cognition was really you know enhanced uh, after that process. Well, that was the biggest benefits that I, when we went ketogenic, the biggest benefits that I noticed was the appetite suppressant, and then like how clear minded I was. Mm-hmm. I definitely can tell when I'm over consuming more than I should in particular carbohydrates the my the way my brain processes things was definitely yep. slower for sure next question is from DB Gill Adam what made you not continue down the path of opening an anytime fitness if someone was set on opening a gym today would you advise the franchise route or doing it on your own <laughs> you know do you know why they asked this question did you see my I, did. I, I saw, saw that, that. Yeah. you went through, that was cool yeah you know I was going through uh, Katrina and I was uh, we're going through the this file cabinet that we had that we had <laughs> moved from the other house and I just really hadn't gone through any of it man and I didn't even I wanted to I didn't even finish sharing I should have I got so caught up in cleaning it all but, um, you know, I almost start, I started this, uh, man, I spent a year and a half writing a business plan uh, called Top Off for a hair salon. If you can imagine. I remember you going. Right. If you can imagine a idea. hair salon uh, meets Hooters, yeah. uh, but a, a more classy upscale version of that. Like the, we we had that and I had all the all the numbers. I mean, we were really excited about it. I was, uh, Top on, Off. Oh, yeah. my God. Isn't that great or what? Yeah. Wasn't that a great this name? I just got it. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jesus Is that a great name or what? I thought it was a great name. And uh, was, I'd like the full service, please. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, so that that never launched, and I never took off with that yet. I spent, uh, geez, a year and a half of writing that one. I did uh, Anytime Fitness. I forgot that how close I was to jumping into that. That was in 2005. I remember now what sparked that was uh, I was on my third or fourth um, comp plan change in the company 24 fitness that I was at. And I remember just being really frustrated and going like, fuck, you know, do I still want to keep working for this company or do I want to go off and do my own thing? And at that time, and I don't remember when any time fitness, maybe Doug can Google search when any time fitness originated, but I believe we were on the front end of that, which if you're going to do a franchise, I'm not a fan of franchises, which is part of the reason why I did not do it. Um, I also opted not to do, um, uh, boot camps uh franchise either my in fact we i mm-hmm. i broke off with my partner uh when i or- originally started boot camps so I, I did boot camps for i think i said five years on my instagram story but it might have been even longer because the two previous years before i was by myself i actually had a partner and he really wanted oh, 2002 thank you doug he really wanted to m- go to operation boot camps which was a a franchise at the time and at that time we were making like thirty something thousand dollars a year on the boot camps, and we were considering really scaling it up. And he thought the answer was for us to franchise, and I completely disagreed. Uh, we went our separate ways. I continued to grow the boot camps to about sixty thousand, sixty seven thousand is what I peaked out on uh, the boot camps, and that was a side business, by the way. Like that wasn't my full time gig. I'm sure if I was full time gigging it, it would have done better. But I I went the opposite direction. I didn't franchise. I grew my own boot camps. Uh, grew the revenue to about 67 grand was what I peaked out at. And he went and did the operation thing and just didn't go anywhere. And he spent $10,000 on the franchise. Uh, So I was right there. I felt I was right on the anytime fitness. Although I do see, I do see value in doing some franchises and I'll explain where, what, what, what I, and what I, what I would want to see in order for me to even consider not, or me consider to do it and to not do my own thing. If you're thinking about doing a gym, which there's a million models like in different types of gyms and sizes and, and the, the, that model has been kind of done and you're thinking about doing a franchise, I'm not a fan of that. And the reason why is because there's nothing really revolutionary. What you're really paying for is they have a brand already. They normally send you over a kit. They give you leads. They do all these things, which that is all beneficial and can help. And if you don't know anything about business and you see, uh, you can see how getting assisted in that area is worth you revenue sharing your uh, your profits. Like I could see some value in that. Now I have more confidence in my business skills, and so I would see no value in that. Now where I do see value is a business like Orange Theory. I've been saying this now for almost four years that if I was the same kid that I was ten years ago and I didn't have my hands full with everything I have now, I one hundred percent would have started one of those because I saw that where it was going. It was very revolutionary for what it was doing at that time. Uh, Orange Theory with the the heart rate monitors and the way they made it like a game for people, uh, I thought that was fucking brilliant. And I think that it was also a perfect time because that was right after CrossFit exploded and we were starting to get backlash with all the injuries from all the Olympic movements uh, that they were doing. And I felt that Orange Theory was an incredible answer to that. I thought their model that they were doing was incredible. And then when you could see the growth rate, I mean, it, it's been on an explosion since it came on the market, I think, in 2009. So if you can catch a franchise that you believe is doing something revolutionary at that time, and you believe that thing is going to continue to grow, then I think there is strategy to attaching yourself to it and using their name that way. Mm-hmm. Now, to do a franchise just because like the example I gave with Operation Bootcamp or maybe doing it anytime fitness now, I don't see as much value. That's my if, personal if you, opinion. So here's the thing, and here's what gets people tripped up. When you do a comparative, when you compare the success rate of people that start a franchise versus people that go private, it's true that people who go with the franchise succeed at a, at a higher rate. There's, more, there's a higher failure rate with people going private. But that's not really telling you the whole story because – because when you go with the franchise, you've got the branding, you've got the planning, and everything's already set up for you. When you go private, what you need to do if you want a real good comparison is take out the people that go private and don't understand that shit. Right. Instead, compare- The ones that are successful. Yeah. Compare the people that understand how there to brand and organize and do everything, and then compare them to the franchise, and I bet you- my, yeah. I bet They're you, going to outperform. I'll bet you money 
the people who go private who understand how to make things look a particular way, have particular systems and do all that stuff, will outperform the franchise. And that and that was my, my that, and that's the thing. You know how to do that. Why I wanted to use the example of the boot camps, my buddy who went and did the operation boot camps, I wanted now he actually grew his you know, arguably to as many I believe he had as many camps running as I did. The difference was I was collecting all of my profit. Mm-hmm. I wasn't having to give away some of my profit because I wasn't they weren't he was getting the leads generated through the franchise. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the leads that he was getting were, were the leads that the franchise was generating from, and that's part of the reason why he had to give up some of right, his profits right, right. for that because he's tied into the franchise. Now, I may have had you know even less people in my camps, but I'm making 100% of the profits because it's me, and I can change my rates to however I want. I can- Way more autonomy. I can, yeah, I, exactly. There's way more autonomy in it, and if you really- now. If you don't know all that stuff, I definitely think there's value. I mean, what I'm seeing in Orange Theory right now, I am just blown away because I've seen, and this is not a knock on these people, it's just fucking fact, I've met several, several owners that own Orange Theories that are crushing financially, and when I meet them and talk to them, they know absolutely fucking nothing about health and fitness, but they're smart businessmen and women that saw the opportunity they now attach themselves to the franchise and that's how great that franchise is right now is that it's been ex- it's it almost runs itself if you have some somewhat of management leadership skills organization skills those things are are exploding but yeah you yeah. have to really be on top of trends and have a good understanding of of you know what people are really seeking these days and so like i mean that one would have been more like you would have known that that was going to be on the uprise if you would pay attention to like a soul cycle or one of these other like franchises out there that were just destroying and they're still destroying because they're providing an experience. And I think like, I mean, there's been multiple business uh, write-ups like recently about all these types of franchises out there. And it's the ones that are providing like this all encompassing kind of an experience that people talk about and they share that gives them that sort of viral uh, component. So, I mean, if you're going to look into franchises, do your homework and look at the trends and see, you know, where people are paying the, uh, the most attention to. Don't just grab like, you know, a, you know, a franchise that has proven themselves in the past. You know, I would look towards the future. And here's the other thing with, with fitness. It just look, I, I've been doing this for, for, professionally for 20 years it's very fad and trend yeah, very volatile yeah so like at one point uh you know curves It'll was the come fucking and go. franchise yeah. and they exploded curves had something like a you know i don't know 800 locations faster than any of the fitness organization and then they tanked you know orange theory is exploding right now mark my words at some point it's gonna drop oh, just because people are not gonna be like oh it's not the cool exact the, when i came into orange theory and, and and brendan brought me on at that point he had only had i think he had three clubs and my exact words were to him was a brilliant move getting your hands in this now take the this hell out i said take <laughs> yeah. this these things get as many as you can in the next three years and then sell yep. and he did yep. he just sold lot this year he sold and uh, maybe we'll get him on the show so we can talk numbers. Oh, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to put his business out there, but I'll tell you right now, the motherfucker Super killed smart it. Smart moves. He's killed made, it. Yeah. Killed it. He sold he sold and he kept himself in as on the board, which is fucking brilliant. So he mm-hmm. gave himself a beautiful salary. He cashed out really big. Now that to me was absolutely brilliant. Mm-hmm. Getting into it if your pet pa- your passion is fitness and you want to that's what you want to do for going forward forever and attaching yourself to a franchise be careful. I mean, yeah. I think they're they're. Plus, I think that you got we got to talk about the brick and mortar versus the virtual. I mean, yeah, yeah. brick and mortar is expensive. It's a big, a lot of money you got to put down. It's a lot of liability. You're limited to your audience. Like, if you have a gym, how many the people in your five mile radius are going to come see you, and that's it? Keep an eye on Craig. It's going to be interesting to watch what he's doing right now. Keep an eye on Craig. I think it's. Oh. Uh, I don't fully agree with his decision. I think uh, he's a he's a great guy to watch do this because mm-hmm. he one is not going to be in there really working it. He says he's going to teach some of his classes. He's he has he's going to approach it the same way that my friend Brendan approached Orange Theory, which is he has you know Brendan has the NFL name. He's a celebrity, and so he used the power and influence that he had to help drive traffic into his clubs. Even though he wasn't operating his clubs, he hired and staffed people to operate uh, the facilities. Craig has the same intention to do with this. Uh, what was it? Rock fitness, rock punch. Oh, fitness. something yeah. was a boxing. Yeah. So Craig around. is basically doing a a twist on what dethrone is or um, box and burn. Box and burn. Yes, which, these which I yeah boxing. I would pay attention to box and burn because they're still 
Yeah, climbing up. They are. They're doing. I think Box and Burn's a good example, and I know they're starting to franchise out. I believe so. I think these are these are some cool models that you see going on. Again, though, back to Sal's point, um, if if you were to get in something like that, one, I'm looking for a franchise that I think is doing something revolutionary. Do I think Box and Burn was very revolutionary? I think that was brilliant. I think that Mm -hmm. was so smart. I think Tony was the right guy to do that. I think they are riding an incredible wave right now, and anybody that jumps on that early is smart. Yeah, be, that would be one I would suggest, yeah, because you actually have somebody teaching the skill of boxing, which wasn't being taught in a lot of these like fitness-type classes. So that's important. That's an important factor. And like if you look at uh, any of these other franchises, what's the unique quality to them that's going to carry them further? But well, just I- think about it this way. like, oh, Let's say you want to open up a franchise. Let's say you want to open up an Anytime Fitness, right? How much money do you think... When all is said and done, getting your location equipped, having enough capital to float you for the first maybe three months or whatever, hiring a staff or however minimal staff it is or whatever, your signage, all that stuff. How much money do you think it's going to cost you? Hundred grand to get started? Yeah. Oh God, no, more okay. than that, way more than that. Okay, yeah. so what? Two hundred grand? Two fifty to five hundred. Okay, yeah. so let's just let's just say on the cheap ass end, two hundred thousand dollars. Now imagine if you took two hundred grand and you you had a you had the same dedication, the same kind of I'm gonna make this work. I'm and I can be stupid with my money. Mm-hmm. Imagine you took two hundred grand and you invested it in a virtual business. Right. You know you don't <laughs> need two hundred grand. You oh. know you ten grand, fifteen grand. Arguably a way better investment. Way better investment. You're not limited. Your audience isn't limited. It, your audience is the fucking world that's on the internet. Yeah. You can go all over the place. You can hire more talent because you have more money. You don't have to sign a lease with anybody. Mm. You're not limited. any. So for me, the brick and mortar is like, man, well, good luck. But. It, it is. And the other thing about um, you know where the real money is in in owning uh, like a franchise gym, like Anytime Fitness, like what Craig is doing, like the Orange Series, is not in one, one gym. It's in proving the model, doing well in one, and then duplicating that, right. which is arguably one of the hardest things to do oh, in business. God. Yeah. It's extremely hard Super to build hard. A, a very successful you know, seven to eight figure business. It's even harder to try and duplicate that uh, multiple times and, and to be successful. And so these little anytime fitness gyms, these little box and burn type of facilities, I mean, I would venture to say you're looking at, on average, of course, there's always outliers, but you're looking at fifty dollars to $150,000 of revenue profit. Like you're not looking at huge profits. And then uh, to scale, open up another location, right, put yeah. more capital, sign another lease, get right. more staff. Replicate right. that culture again, you oh. know, get all that going. Yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's a monster. A, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of liability. Whereas in the virtual world, you see something works to scale. It's fucking easy. It's not hard at all. Like, oh, cool, that works. Let's spend a little bit more money on this advertising, a little bit more money on this, and and that's it. Well, right. it's complicated. It's there not you easy. Go. But yeah. uh, so if you want uh, free fitness information, we have a bunch of guides. They're totally free. The latest one is how to squat like a pro. Just go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of them. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.